Uh, our next, next speaker is Zoe Tuzignan, uh, who is known to me as a PhD student in art history at Concordia University. I have the privilege of being her supervisor. I will admit that immediately. Her doctoral research concerns photographic modernism in Canadian illustrated magazines between 1925 and 1945. She holds a master's degree in museum studies from the University of Leeds in England and a bachelor's degree in art history from Concordia University. She has published articles in Ciel Variable and Archivaria, as well as contributing an essay to the catalogue Québec, une ville et ses artistes, produced by the Musée National des Beaux-Arts du Québec in 2008. In 2007, she was awarded a CGS Doctoral Fellow uh, Scholarship from Shirk, and she currently holds a doctoral research bursary from Bibliothèque et Archive Nationale du Québec. In short, we are in Zoe's house today. <laughs> Le travail de Zoe Tuzignan est une lecture de six revues populaires du début du XXe siècle qui définissent même construisent, selon elle, un pays, le Canada, dans toute sa modernité. Ce grand projet de recherche est aujourd'hui représenté par une analyse de position prise par les rédacteurs du Canadian Magazine sur les questions de nationalisme et d'identité, un questionnement inexhaustible que Renan aurait reconnu comme étant notre réponse à la grande question « qu'est-ce qu'une nation ?». Mais comme nous explique Zoé, les rédacteurs du Canadian Magazine auraient peut-être répondu autrement, mettant l'accent sur culture et l'histoire et offrant une alternative à la corruption morale et intellectuelle représentée par les revues américaines. Donc, Edward, listen up. Ce qui nous intéresse le plus dans cette histoire est l'utilisation de l'image photographique et l'effet de l'effet moderniste manifesté en photomontage. Zoé. Donc, j'aimerais remercier tout d'abord Vincent Lavoie et euh, Myrna pour avoir euh, organisé ce colloque et euh, d'avoir accepté <rire> mon travail, de m'avoir donné la chance d'y participer. Et j'aimerais dire en passant que passer à la fin d'un colloque, c'est vraiment ma mort. Alors, merci beaucoup. Merci. Bon. La prochaine fois, tu vas commencer. OK. Merci. So, the paper that I'm presenting today will eventually be part of my doctoral thesis, which is provisionally titled Magazines and the Making of Photographic Modernism in Canada, 1925 to 1945. My decision to turn to the magazine as a central object of study comes from a deep interest in how photography was both disseminated and received in Canada during the first half of the 20th century. The six periodicals that I'm focusing on, which include the Canadian magazine, the subject of my presentation today, have this in common. They are all mass circulation, heavily illustrated popular magazines with a wide appeal. As I will be arguing, the language of photographic modernism was used by the Canadian magazine in particular to construct or imagine a picture of Canada as a modern country, a country which in the 1920s and 1930s was taking its place within the international community of modern indu industrialized nations. And crucial to this picture was the nationalist editorial policy of the magazine with which I will begin. The Canadian Magazine, a monthly publication also referred to as The Canadian, was founded in Toronto in 1893. From the very beginning, its mission was to represent and cultivate Canadian patriotism and Canadian interests. Yet in its initial form, the magazine was intended for a select, intellectually minded audience. In Jan January 1926, it was announced that Hugh C. McLean Publications, which also published numerous small industrial and commercial magazines, had become the owner of the Canadian. The Hugh C. McLean Company was distinct from the McLean Publishing Company, which was run by John Bain, McLean Hugh's brother, who published McLean's. 
Over the course of about two years, with Andrew McLean, another member of the family, acting as editor, the Canadian was transformed into a mass magazine typical of the era. Its size increased dramatically, the number of pages went up, the amount of photographs and illustrations multiplied, the price per copy went down from 25 cents to 10 cents, and the circulation numbers rose from 13,800 to 61,000. They would eventually reach the 137,000 mark in the late 1930s. When he took on the role of vice president of the company in 1928, Andrew McLean was succeeded by the Irish-born journalist and historian, Joseph Lister Rutledge, which you see portrayed here, who would continue as editor until the magazine folded in 1939. With both of these men, but especially with Rutledge, the original Canadianist policy was continually refined and would become central to the conception of, of the publication's role in Canadian society. For the next decade, Rutledge would, as Hugh McLean affirmed in his written introduction of the new editor, work to, quote, represent the Canadian spirit and to foster and encourage a wholesome belief in ourselves. At the center of this Canadianist stance, was a desire to actively promote both Canadian culture, embodied principally by contemporary literature, and Canadian history. Like other magazines of its kind, the Canadian was filled with stories and serials that could take up as much as two-thirds of each issue. Unlike others, however, the magazine prided itself on being the only one in the country to publish the work of almost exclusively Canadian authors. Rutledge believed that Canadian fictional authors, whether native or adopted, were just as talented as those from Britain or the US. In the editorial for the June 1932 issue, which you see here, he announced, quote, we believe that the development of Canadian literature and art is, a, is of vital importance to Canada. If the editors of English and United States publications can discover, as they have done, innumerable Canadian writings of outstanding quality, then it might be possible for Canadian editors to do the same. It is on that very simple and precise concept that we have based the policy of the Canadian magazine. Also paramount was the magazine's promotion of Canadian history. And what you see here is uh, part of a series of articles on uh, the role of Canada in the First World War. Its mission was to provide readers with popularized stories of Canada's greatest achievements and historical events. Many of the photographically illustrated, illustrated features in the late 1920s and early 1930s thus looked backward in order to create a shared foundation for a Canadian identity in the present. These illustrated historical features, as well as non-illustrated ones, were unanimously admired by the magazine's readers, who voiced their thoughts on the necessity of such features in a monthly page that published letters to the editor. Two examples from the mid-1930s, both from Quebec, are worth citing. One reader from Longueuil stated that, quote, with these Canadian items, you are conferring a high favor upon all readers as you are instilling a new, a national consciousness among the reading public. While another from Sherbrooke wrote, this country is steeped in old stuff and the danger is that it's going to get away from us unless grabbed and written up. What makes me sore is the way Yankee syndicates flood most of our magazine sections every week with junk about Hollywood and actors and lurid tripe. And the big papers pass up all the wealth of early historical stuff lying right inside the country. I have included this reference to Hollywood and lurid tripe purposefully, as it leads me to another pivotal aspect of the magazine's Canadianism. From the moment it was taken over by the Hugh C. McLean Company, the Canadianist policy of the magazine was clearly articulated as a reaction to the huge amount and influence of American publications and other products of mass culture coming into the country at the time. 
As stated by both the magazine's editors and its readers, the inundation of Canadian newsstands, bookstores, cinemas, and radio waves by American mass culture was an unwelcome problem that needed to be counteracted. Excuse me. But the sheer copiousness of American mass culture in Canada was not the only contested issue. In question was also its quality. Magazines from across the line, an expression used repeatedly, were said by readers of the Canadian to be trashy, immoral, and filled with sex problems and sensational claptrap. The Canadian, on the other hand, was continually praised for its cleanliness. One reader from Toronto wrote that she, quote, was not ashamed to be reading the Canadian on the streetcar or to have it on her table in full view of any visitors, <laughs> clearly an indication of the magazine's moral acceptability. But for the editors, the issue was less about morals than about mores. American periodicals were not openly condemned, yet they were taken to be the cause of what was seen as the disintegration of Canadian values and customs. They believed that, overwhelmed by the pervasiveness of the American point of view on every aspect of life, from politics to art and entertainment, Canadians were becoming Americanized and were thus losing sight of what it meant to be Canadian. Crucial to Rutledge was the counteractive voice offered by the magazine. In his hands, the Canadian spoke directly to its public, and whether it spoke of national or international affairs, the positions advanced were in the interest of Canadians. As he wrote in the September 1928 issue, it is modifying and qualifying and putting our own peculiar coloring on the ex opinions expressed that is the chief duty of Canadian magazines. For Rutledge, the magazine represented a tool via which an overarching nationalist discourse could be promulgated, and therefore via which the disintegration of Canadian culture could be countered. Making a link with pre-Confederation idealizations of the railway in a January 1936 ed editorial entitled Magazines and National Unity, Rutledge proposed that magazines such as the Canadian were to be the national voice that could unify the country despite its internal geographical, cultural, or linguistic distinctions. And it was no accident that the tool he saw as most propitious was a medium of mass communication. In fact, I believe that the Canadian's policy would not have worked had it not been coupled with a particular conception of the modern illustrated magazine. In a short editorial entitled, What is a Canadian? published in October 1936, Rutledge asserts that the modern magazine is a universal form of mass communication and that therefore, it should not be surprising that the Canadian looks quite similar to its American or British counterparts. He claimed that the magazine as a medium of entertainment originated in the US and came to full fruition there. There, he wrote, have been tested out many of the new ideas that are not sectional, but psychological, that gain a response not from Americans alone, or Britons or Canadians, but from all humanity. Thus, the form of the magazine versus the content was deemed universal since, in, according, in accordance with new ideas regarding the psychology of reception, it was crafted to solicit a uniform response. What I wish to propose is the idea that the purported universalist form of the modern illustrated magazine which photography was instrumental in shaping, was used to put forward a view of Canada as a mature country with a mass culture of its own, a mass culture that could compete with those of other nations. And it was precisely the form of the magazine that signified the country's contemporaneity. The imaginaire du présent that I am arguing was at work in the Canadian, has therefore less to do with actual photographic representations of recent events than with how photography was deployed in the magazine. 
As already mentioned, many of the photographically illustrated features in the late 1920s and early 30s looked backward in order to create a shared foundation for a Canadian identity in the present. It is as though in, the first, in these first few years of the magazine's renewed Canadianist mandate, an image of the country's past needed to be established in order to move forward. For example, illustrated articles such as these were common. On the left is an article from January 1929 on the role of mills and millers in early Canadian history. And on the right is one from July 1934, which recounts the story of Fort York and Toronto. As the 1930s wore on, a more marked embracing of contemporary subject matter can be discerned, but still it is arguable whether the images reproduced can be said to belong to the category of news photography. While their contemporaneity is certainly a key factor, these images do not necessarily represent fleeting singular events snapped sur le vif, but instead capture a time frame that I would qualify as an extended present. In the, exa in the example that you see here, a January 1935 article entitled Man's Quest for Speed, even though the photographs do actually stop planes, trains, and automobiles dead in their tracks, the emphasis is not on the particular events, but on the general newness of such modes of transportation and the accelerated tempo of modern life. Or here is another example from April 1937, which, by the way, cannot but be compared to the FSA photographs published in American magazines during the same period. Are the Prairies Doomed, an article on the severe droughts that had been displacing inhabitants of Alberta, Manitoba, and Saskatchewan since 1929, also operates in this prolonged present mode. The images included belong to a now that is not tied to a specific fraction of time. My point is that it didn't matter. The magazine's representation of Canada's contemporaneity rested on the visual language used to frame the photographs we produced. In the same way, it did not matter that, in the latter half of the 1930s especially, the magazine featured many photographs whose subject was not Canadian. For example, as the approach of the Second World War was being felt internationally, the magazine published numerous articles by Wilson Woodside, a Canadian journalist who traveled throughout Europe with his wife and reported on the political upheavals taking place in Italy, Russia, Germany, Spain, Britain, and elsewhere. Frequently illustrated with Woodside's own photographs, these articles were written from a highly personal Canadian perspective. They attempted to draw out the implications of such upheavals for the readers of the magazine. And of course, what you're seeing here is uh, images by Woodside on the right, and the portrait of Hitler is from the series by Heinrich Hoffmann, taken in 1927, I believe, around. So a uh, combination of images coming from the outside and images of Germany taken by Woodside. So these images are, so to speak, the photographic manif manifestation of the editor's championing of a Canadian voice. Again, for Rutledge, regardless of whether the magazine spoke of national or international affairs, the opinions expressed were in the interest of Canadians. The visual language employed to represent Canada's contemporaneity is that referred to as photographic modernism, a term deliberately opposed to the more commonly used modernist photography to describe a range of imagery that extends well beyond the sphere of art. The term, which has been purposefully employed by such historians of photography as Carol Payne, is meant to be inclusive of mass culture and there to bridge the great divide, no small task. I have decided to run with photographic modernism in my doctoral thesis, 
for it allows me to investigate the way modernist imagery was circulated in Canada during the first half of the 20th century without having recourse to what I deem to be the trap of authorship, which in Canada at least has led to dead ends. It leaves the way open to the study of types of images that crossed both artistic and national borders. In concrete terms, photographic modernism takes on various configurations within the context of magazines, but chief among them is the montage aesthetic. It may even seem odd to be isolating this kind of representation, since montage, defined here as the artful com combination of multiple images and of image and text, is the working principle of the modern magazine. Indeed, the montage aesthetic can be seen in such iconic and artistically significant modern magazines as AIZ, Vue, Life, and Look. It was within the pages of periodicals like these that the approach to the magazine medium that Rutledge identified as universal was developed and refined. The montage aesthetic was central to the way in which the producers of ma magazines effectively communicated with the reading public. It was through the careful cutting up of photographs and their placement among textual statements that the minds of readers were thought to be reachable and even controllable. As an aesthetic device, montage was very much of its time, and I believe it was by means of such signs of modernity that the Canadian magazine conveyed the contemporaneity of the country it sought to represent. The imaginaire du présent at work in the Canadian goes beyond the time frame depicted by individual photographs to permeate the very method via which photography was disseminated. By using the vocabulary of photographic modernism, the producers of the Canadian were able to confer upon Canada the look of the new. Thank you.